this week on the Back Table Podcast. This is complicated social cultural construct that we really can uncover and learn a lot. I mean, I recently saw a couple she was coming in pain with sex. They weren't communicating about it. I'm like, go read my book, go see the physical therapist. She comes back and she's like, we've been married for 45 years. We're having the best sex of our lives now. Thank you so much. She's like, we started talking about it. We communicate. We try new things. Like, it's okay to try things and fail, right? But like, I get the wins coming back. Like, I've saved marriages repeatedly, right? And I'd say, to me, that is more satisfying than seeing if I can get a semi-erect penis 20% better. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. I'm your host again today, Dr. Suzette Sutherland. I'm excited to have Dr. Kelly Kasperson as our guest for this special episode discussing a variety of issues pertaining to women's sexual health. Good morning, Dr. Kasperson. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Kasperson. She is a urologist who practices in Bellingham, Washington, which is a couple hours north of Seattle, where, is, where I am. She's a fellow Minnesotan. Yay. She specializes in all things that have to do with pelvic health and has a very special interest, as I said, in women's sexual health. I think it's probably fair to say that Dr. Casperson, during her years in practice, noticed there was really a, a paucity of really good quality information that was digestible and readily available to women, especially in the area of sexual health. And so she started her own, I guess you could call it, educational mission to educate women about sexual health. She started her own podcast, which she appropriately called You Are Not Broken. And with that, she turned that into a book and has also done a TED Talk. So kudos to you for all of that success. That's really very exciting. The podcast and the book has been on the top of the Amazon viewer list as well as the bestseller list for some time. So it's really a wonderful resource. So I wanted to ask you, Dr. Kasperson, about that. Tell us a little bit more about your journey with that. I know that there are many of us in practice who get frustrated. We feel like we pull the cord and we say the same thing all the time. And you turned that into something wonderful by doing this podcast to educate patients and then a book. That was really wonderful. How did you do that? And what resources did you feel you need in order to actualize that dream? Yeah, well, I mean, I joke now that I worked really hard to not work hard at all in clinic. So people will come to me and I'll be like, go listen to this episode, go read my book, come back. Because I don't have to repeat myself because I've created these amazing resources, right? But I joke with that. But about seven years into my career, I was getting very bored. I was like, having an existential crisis, like, I'm just going to see recurrent UTIs for the rest of my life. What am I doing? This is easy. I'm bored. And really, I think the universe knew that the time was right to like have lightning hit my brain. And that was in the form of a patient who I had uh, cured her bladder cancer and we became friends. And I was seeing her once a year, just your once a year checkup. She's doing great. She was crying in my office because of her lack of sexual relations in a, her otherwise wonderful marriage. And as I was handing her a box of Kleenex, the lightning struck and it said, We're, urologists are so good at taking care of erections and, and men's sexual health. What do we know about women? Who is taking care of the women? And really, it was my inability to help her, a person I very much cared about, that sent me deep diving into the sex med literature for females. And it turns out we know a lot about all the biopsychosocial aspects of female sexuality. It just has not trickled down into either Hollywood, the top 10 country hits, or medicine. All three of those things are doing a very bad job. And where do women go? Right. And so I started a podcast. I had a voice in my head and the voice is like, you got to talk, you got to talk. And uh, I really like podcasts. And so I'm like, well, I'll start a podcast. That podcast is going to be four years old this January. And it's top international podcast. And the things, it's absolutely insane who I have access to, who's interested, all the amazing things about a podcast because it's giving women hope it's giving them science-based education. It's giving them a friendly physician who cares about them greatly. And the funny thing about that is I started an Instagram account just to get more people to listen to my podcast. And now the Instagram's so big, people are like, you have a podcast? But one thing I learned a lot 
from getting out of the clinic. We all think we're doing a very good job. And you get out of the clinic and you get into the Instagram and you start listening to women, not only from around America, but from around the world. And you realize medicine is not doing a good job at all. These women are suffering extremely. I'm on my fourth doctor. I'm on my fifth doctor. My doctor said there was nothing to do. My doctor said, get a new relationship. My doctor said, just drink alcohol. Like the advice is atrocious. And not until I let myself get bigger out of the clinic did I understand the extreme need and problem we have in our healthcare system in taking care of women. And so it's really, for me, number one, just education. It's fun. We're good at it. We know so much. We've done so much training. But number two, there's a very unique lens that urologist has compared to a gynecologist, say. My lens is that of equality. And the reason is I take care of the men. We don't tell them to get a new relationship, just drink alcohol, or just deal with getting old. We do not say the same things to them. And so to me now, that's my foray in the hormones. Basically, I got into hormones because of sex, right? Because of the big myth of what happens to your sex life with menopause. And to me, this is a quality. And until everybody's treated the exact same as far as hormones and sexuality goes in healthcare, I've got a lot of work to do. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. So, well, that brings me to my first real thoughts about this is that so we know there are so many men's health clinics all over the country. You can't get online without seeing something about how it's going to make your erection bigger and all that. And, you know, that's wonderful that men have resources, but there's really such limited stuff for women. And the focus is just not on the women at all. But how much of that is because of our limited knowledge? You said we do know quite a bit, but I think when we look at the science and what we have, where do you think we are with respect to the science and where can we be moving forward to understand more about what causes some of the problems of women and then ergo how to fix that? Yeah, I mean, urologists and, and physicians in general, we're in the same pool that everybody else is in. And what that pool is, is a really crappy sex education system, right? We got a disease and pregnancy prevention plan. We never learned to communicate. We never learned that there would be roadblocks and bumps and difficulties, right? So we are just as awkward. And, and most medical schools, and there's data on this, most medical schools do not provide good training in how to communicate to patients about sex. So it's awkward for everybody. And Doctors really haven't done a good job of like making up for the deficiencies that we got along with everybody else in terms of sex ed. So really talking about the bias of like, do we let women be sexual? Are they sexual beings? Do we think it's a problem when their sex life is different than it used to be? Do we judge them differently than we judge men? And really thinking even the biopsychosocial, right? For once Viagra got invented, like this was a blood flow problem. And we really ignored the relationships, the stress, the anxiety, the performance anxiety, the, all the other the stress that can affect erections, right? We kind of really made it biologic. And I would argue in the female domain, and again, I'm oversimplifying, but we really make the female domain like, you're just stressed, you're just anxious. And it couldn't possibly be a blood flow problem, couldn't possibly be a side effect of your diabetes, couldn't possibly be a side effect of your antidepressants, right? Like we've taken the biologic out of women and made it all about their brain. And so really making sure we're thinking of both humans in the biopsychosocial realm. That's a great, great point. Yeah, you do hear that. I mean, we do know the importance of the biopsychosocial components, and it's not just about how well the parts work, right? That is a piece of it. And the biopsychosocial is another piece, but you can't forego one for the other. Absolutely. That's a great way to think of it. I appreciate that. So, yeah, that brings me to the next thought is that when Viagra came out, I'm old enough to remember when Viagra first hit the market and I was in my training and what it did for men, right? And some can argue it helped the biopsychosocial component for men, gave them confidence, right? But it really wasn't the panacea for women because most women don't have the same biological problems so that the men do as well, although there are some issues there. So when we look at female sexual dysfunction, what would you say in your practice that you see or your knowledge of what the prevalence data is today? What is the prevalence of some type of female sexual complaints in women? Oh, yeah. I mean, it depends upon age group and how you ask the question and blah, blah, blah. But about 40 percent is very similar to male. Erectile dysfunction, 40 percent by age 40, according to the Cleveland Clinic. Probably the same for females. So we're not unique. Would we start like, oh, women are special? No, we're not unique. We're humans, just like those humans. And we, you know, we've got the same issues. 
And we need to address them just the same. But going back, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, female sexual dysfunction. Some people don't have sex lives and they're perfectly fine with that. We're never here to say you should be having sex. You need to be having sex. So a big thing about defining female sexual dysfunction is are you actually bothered by it? Right. And the second part of that is going back to how bad our sex ed is. Most people don't know that women don't orgasm by putting something in their vagina. So we're having women in heterosexual relationships, having penis and vagina sex, never having an orgasm, faking orgasms. We have a disaster of a sex education. They don't know that the clitoris is important. People don't know where the clitoris is. So do you have a woman come into your office? You got to step back and be like, OK, how do you have sex? What is it an orgasm? You got to ask the right questions because education goes so far like that lubrication helps orgasms. And people have, are all judgy about lube, right? So we can get into the medications that are available. But I always say I never prescribe a medication on the first date unless it's vaginal estrogen because they, they need the education. And that's why I say go listen to my podcast, go read the book, start learning how to communicate, especially if we are talking a sexless marriage. It's been six months. It's been two years. It's been eight years. And I would argue that the advent of Viagra was not great for relationships. It's a disruptor. And we have papers on that. Because when you provide one person out of two with better sex and you don't address their partner, whether it's genital urinary syndrome of menopause, pain with sex, low desire, you have created a rift. And I would say urologists are part of the problem, often more than they're part of the solution. When a guy comes to see me for Viagra, I always ask about a partner. Is there a partner involved? Is she seeing somebody? Are her needs being addressed? Have you communicated to her about your plan for bringing home the super penis? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> 10 times out of 10, they've never they have not talked to their partner about it. I think urologists are in the dark. Or you see the woman who comes in who needs to get, quote unquote, I'm making air quotes, fixed. She's being sent by her husband or she's sending herself to get fixed so that she can then perform better for her husband. Right. But he's not part of the solution. Right. Which is really hard. So clearly there are relationship components here. And that's a big take home message. Right. Is that there has to be a good relationship so that there's communication about what the mutual needs are in this sexual relationship. Yeah. And you know, sex doesn't exist in a bubble. We're busy. We're stressed. We're taking care of kids. We've got elderly parents. We might be shift workers, shift workers being on call. All of that is horrible for our sex lives. And if we don't know that and understand eating healthy food, exercising, sleep, it all affects our sexuality and our sex life and our interest in having sex. Our sex life does not exist in a bubble. If you just give somebody a pill and you don't address all that other stuff, now they're a medication failure. Now they feel really broken. So I really like to clean all that stuff up before introducing the medications. Yeah. I can't tell you also how many times on every new patient I ask, are you sexually active? That's one of the categories, right? You go down the plethora of questions that you're asking that have to do with pelvic health. And I get so often, well, dot, 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 pause, I'm married. I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Right. We all know in our own minds what we think that that means in a, maybe, you know, a woman in her 40s, 50s, 60s. It's alarming to me how many younger women, though, say that too, are in a relationship, have several young kids at home and say something like that. So it's not just the postmenopausal 60, 70 year olds that are saying that. Right. And that's where I think that we really have an opportunity to make a difference. Right. And to try and bring the joy of the sexual you know, encounter, the sexual endeavors back to the relationship for the woman, not just to be something that she's obligatorily <laughs> doing her marriage duty, whatever, though. So. Yeah, I mean, that's very, very important. It's very common. It is not researched enough. I've been begging people to research this because we re we have a lot of research on consent and these kind of desire mis in like college students because they're easy to they're easy to research because they're at a university. Right. But as far as like a heterosexual older person, older 30, whatever, not in college, the obligatory sex, duty sex, pity sex, whatever you want to call it. A woman cannot say hell yeah to sex if she can't say no. And that is a big issue. Again, it's our sex ed learning that no means no. And if you're having sex for somebody else, especially if you're having sex to control somebody else's behavior, he'll get cranky. He'll get pissed. He'll get mopey. I'm having sex to control somebody else's behavior. Sex isn't awesome for you. It is not about you. You can never get to a hell yes if you're performing an act for those other things. 
And again, there are not enough sex therapists in this nation. Like we need way, way more. Women will come in and they'll say, I have low desire. And we say, great, we've got some FDA approved medications for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Right. But if there is other reasons that they have low desire because sex is not about them, their pleasure is not considered equal. Orgasms are not considered equal. Orgasm gap. Many people, again, haven't heard of that. But the heterosexual relationship is the widest orgasm gap. Heterosexual male has an orgasm about 97, 98 percent of time when he has penetrative intercourse with a female. She has an orgasm and an orgasm, a marker of pleasure. Right. We can argue if that's the proper marker of pleasure, but they're using that as a marker of pleasure. She has an orgasm about 60 percent of the time. That's in a committed relationship. Way worse with hookup sex college campuses. 30 percent or less. So we are largely biased in who gets to have the pleasure in these scenarios. And if somebody's having less pleasure, you're going to desire it less. That's just dopamine. Yeah, totally. So I was going to move into that desire category, but I think this brings us into more of the orgasmic category. And let's just talk about that for a minute while we're on that topic is just a really the very fallow centric idea of intercourse and what that's supposed to do for women that we see in older movies in Hollywood, right? Just that moment of penetration and she's having an orgasm, which is so false, versus the role of the clitoris and then what kind of education we need to do for our partners, whatever gender our partners are, as to how that's really the orgasmic organ. Yeah. I mean, talk about things you didn't learn about in medical school, right? And the reason, I mean, the clitoris is amazing. It's the one organ in anybody whose sole job is pleasure. That's a freaking cool organ, right? And then you're like, what about the penis? Penis has three functions for all the urologists listening. It has to pee, it has to get semen out, and it has pleasure. So clitoris has one function, pleasure. We don't get taught about it. And then our, our sex ed includes penis and vagina don't get pregnant. So it really is the organ of pleasure. It is innervated like a penis. It looks like a penis. These are homologous structures. So if guys think their penis is a big deal, that's what a clitoris is. <laughs> that's awesome. Most women, yeah, most women who orgasm because of penetrative sex, one of two things are happening. Number one, they're getting concomitant clitoral stimulation. Number two, their clitoris anatomically. Some clitorises are just closer to the vaginal opening, so it's getting attention that way. So that's really a very good point, right? So again, even when people talk about the G-spot, right, and they talk about different positions with intercourse, and so we don't really know a lot about the anatomy of the G-spot. We know that there was a lot of hype in the 70s about that, but some subsequent data shows where some sensitive areas in the vagina are, but not as sensitive by any means as the clitoral area and with respect to orgasmic ability. So yeah, I mean, the G-spot, the modern term is the G-zone. It's not a spot that makes people think it's small. It's not small. It is the periurethral, basically where you're making an incision for a sling. So it's anterior vaginal wall, about an inch in, underneath the urethral clitoral complex. When it's innervated, you are innervating clitoral nerves, basically. So think of it as one and the same. It's an internal way of hitting the clitoris. But then when you say that, too, if you again, to make that point about the innovation of the clitoris versus the intervaginal wall under the urethra in this G zone, with surgery, we don't have women that have a sling surgery and they can't have an orgasm now, all these women. So again, it just speaks to the difference and in the innovation and the intensity of the innovation of the clitoris and how much more important that is. Yeah, I mean, I think any sling surgery should have a consent that this could affect sexual function. I think we do that over and over with men and prostates and penises. Oh, absolutely. We mm -hmm. should do that. But the data suggests that you fix a woman's incontinence, her sex life gets better. So there's many, many data saying the sling actually is great for your sex life because now you're not self-conscious about leaking. Your body image is feeling a little bit better. It can be good. But there should be an informed consent of like, hey, it's pretty rare, but we're operating around the area. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move into the area of desire then, libido, and where we are today with that. We certainly think of the most influential component as a hormonal component, but we know there are a lot of neurotransmitters that are involved there as well. And yeah, so that's sort of the normal teaching, right? That's why I want you to talk about that. We do see this libido seems to decrease as women age, but is it multifactorial? And we're all just throwing it in that hormonal bucket and blaming it on just a lack of hormones of menopause. So what are your thoughts on that? Desire is an amazing topic. It is not easy. It's not simple. It's different for everybody. And we got to start with the basics. So 
If you break down two different types of desire, we've got responsive and we've got spontaneous. Spontaneous is your new relationship energy. You are like, it's like your brain is on crack. It doesn't care about work. It doesn't care about food. It doesn't care about anything else. You got this new person in your life that is hot and heavy. That is spontaneous desire. That goes away. The brain normalizes. The brain gets adapts. It gets used to stuff. That new relationship desire goes away around 12 months. So in our society, we have put on a hierarchy that monogamous relationships, long-term monogamous relationships are something that we participate in. That's fascinating. But we can't say, I'm in this 10-year relationship. I wish I had spontaneous desire. It's not how brains work, right? So it's really understanding the brain. And also, that's what we're sold. That's what Hollywood is. That's what music is. It's really telling us that spontaneous desire is the default. One might argue it might be the male default. You know, testosterone's of 800 will do that to people. But it's really not everybody's lived experience. And it's quite normal to have responsive desire. What responsive desire is, is I'm busy, I'm at work, I'm thinking about other things, I'm not thinking about sex. But when I'm put in a sexual context, my partner and I are starting to get together, I'm starting to think about it, oh, we're starting to feel it, now I want sex, I'm happy having it, it's a great time. So when a woman comes in and she says, I have low desire, I always say, why is that a problem, right? And the, the question is, do you like sex? If she doesn't like sex, it's not she doesn't have the orgasms. She's doing it for somebody else. She's doing it to keep somebody else happy, whatever it might be. You can't desire that. You do not have a low desire problem. You have a sex is an awesome problem. My analogy is I love haagen mint chip ice cream. Like I will eat it. I have spontaneous desire for haagen mint chip ice cream. You give me melted ice cream, I don't want it. So that is like if the sex isn't good, of course you're not going to desire it. That's dopamine. You have to have something worth desiring in order to create the desire. And then as far as the responsive desire, if you love having sex and it's great and you, you always forget how good it is, it's just lovely, you just get busy. That's not a problem either. It's prioritize sex. Again, we don't get taught scheduling sex. I don't spontaneously want to work out, but I'm a very fit person because I love it when I do it and I want it in my life. I don't have spontaneous desire for working out. Same with vegetables. So it's like if you think about sex as a just not unique thing, it's just another thing in our life of like, if you want to prioritize it, prioritize it. An amazing sex life doesn't help in itself. You're making me laugh. Good. Sex, lima beans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she brings vegetables into the conversation. <laughs> it's normalizing an otherwise awkward conversation, right? That's what you have to do for patients. Otherwise, they can't listen if you can't make them laugh and you can't normalize it like, yeah, yeah, I want to exercise, but like unless I prioritize it, it's not going to happen. But I love it when I do it. I love it in my life. There's an amazing book called Magnificent Sex by Peggy Kleinplatz, and she looked at all these people. She basically said, who's having amazing sex? Right? These people raised their hand. She researched them. Not one of them said they had an amazing sex life because of spontaneous desire. That is not an ingredient in a wonderful sex life. It's prioritizing. It's communicating all of the good things that creates for an excellent sex life. So, that, I mean, that's why desire is so fun and interesting because nobody knows anything about it. They all think that it should be like Hollywood, Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz or whatever. That's not how it is. And you can have an amazing sex life without having spontaneous desire. When you get into perimenopause and hormones that you asked about, that was the myth. That's why I got into hormones because people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what happens to sex after menopause? And I'm like, what's the data show? So I did the same thing that I did for female sexual health. I'm like, let's go look at the menopause data and sex lives. The two top reasons that women stop having sex after menopause, number one, availability of partner. Number two, vasomotor symptoms of menopause, hot flashes, night sweats, poor sleep, worse mood. Well, I can't help you with the first problem, but I, now I can help you with the second one, right? You get a woman feeling better, her desire can naturally come back up. Good point. So with that, so when we think about the vasomotor symptoms of menopause, we think about replacing the estrogen. Of course, if they have a uterus, a progesterone too for safety issues, but also progesterone can be helpful for insomnia issues and other kinds of things. But let's just get into the big taboo, capital T, testosterone. It's not really a taboo, not in my world, but in many people's worlds, it still is. And they, they're very leery about dabbling in the testosterone pool. 
Tell us a little bit more about the importance of testosterone or how it's used, if it is used in women, what your experience has been with it. Yeah, we're at the tip of the iceberg on this. This is going to start getting big, I think. And you got to step back. Did you learn in medical school that women had more testosterone in their bodies than estrogen? No, <laughs> I did. I did not. I learned that about three years ago. And the reason he doesn't even look that way in the labs, because they're measured and like one's picograms per milliliter and one's deciliter per blah, blah, blah. So that you actually have to do the conversion. So I did the conversion on my labs. And unless you're pregnant, because that's a pretty high estrogen level, at all times, you have more testosterone in your body than estrogen. Women, did, if you Google testosterone, it says the male hormone on Google. Like we have a branding problem with this hormone. We gendered hormones and it's hurting us. It's going to continue to hurt us. Also, see also men have estrogen and they have problems when their estrogen goes down. A fascinating article on blocking men's estrogen and seeing what happens. So we all have these hormones just in variable amounts. Women have more testosterone than estrogen, just on average about 10% the amount of testosterone that a man's body has. So that's where you have to start because if I come hot and heavy in being like, oh my God, you should give women testosterone, it sounds insane unless you back up and understand the physiology of bodies. So we say ovaries make estrogen. That's what we learned. Ovaries make androgens, which get converted to estrogens. You cannot have an estrogen molecule without it passing through one of two androgens in our bodies. That also helps us understand why testosterone is important, right? So testosterone will go a little slower down after menopause, but there is a role for testosterone in perimenopause as well. I've treated a lot of, of women who are not quite done with their periods with testosterone. The acceptable, air quotes, acceptable reason to give a, a postmenopausal woman testosterone is low desire. That's a whole bunch of bias. Why is the only reason for a woman to have testosterone to make her want to sleep with somebody? Like once you sit and meditate on that, it is insanity, right? Like that's a nice perk, but is that the only legitimate reason? Same thing I do with sex, same thing I do with menopause, same thing I'm doing with testosterone, deep dive into the literature. We've been giving women testosterone since the 1940s. This stuff has been around for a very long time. We've given it to try to treat breast cancer with it. We've got data that say it decreases your risk of breast cancer. We've given it to women post breast cancer. We've got tons of testosterone data. Yet here we are in a country that does not have an FDA approved testosterone product because of the FDA saying we need years more of safety data compared to a man's testosterone product to prove safety. We have gender bias in what it takes to get a product approved. So we're pushed into using an off-label product. We can use a man's testosterone gel, dose it appropriately for women, or we have to do compounded, or we have to do pellets. People would argue pellets are super therapeutic, so you're going to get a lot more side effects. Some people get benefits. Some people do very well at those higher testosterones but you're seeing a lot more side effects than if you could appropriately dose a testosterone product with something that was FDA approved. Yeah. So, you know, there was such a hype using testosterone for female sexual dysfunction was the term FSD. It's the end of the 90s, early 2000s. I was around then in urology and people were either jumping on the bandwagon, seeing what was happening with this or not. And we really thought it was going to be something. I know I dabbled in that area giving women test stim, right, a little bit, because there wasn't, to your point, there wasn't anything that was marketed for women, and so we used it off-label. And it really fell by the wayside, unfortunately, I think, and they were scared to use it. I think it's because the FDA didn't back it. What kind of work do you think we need to do, really, to get the FDA to listen to the importance of these hormones so that we can get a commercially available product for women? Yeah. Yeah, I think go, just going back to the 90s, I think the testosterone falling off happened for two reasons. Number one, I think we underdosed testosterone, right? A lot of studies that tried to get through the FDA it showed great safety, but not great efficacy. And I would argue that we weren't dosing high enough to see efficacy. And then the other thing is we can't, we can't take this big umbrella of sexual dysfunction, throw testosterone at it, and expect testosterone to fix all of it, right? Like testosterone only helps sexual dysfunction when it's a low testosterone issue. So again, it may not fix your relationship. It will not make you want him more. It will not make you resent him less. So like you take sexual dysfunction and you're like, testosterone doesn't always work. And it's like, yeah, obviously, <laughs> right? Like until you understand the complexities of sexual dysfunction. 
Same with men. You get men with low erections and low testosterone, you give them testosterone, their erections don't always get better, right? So I always like to say, like, women are not overly complicated. We just don't understand this enough. What we need, yeah, it's a fascinating topic because testosterone is a hormone, you know, naturally occurring. You can't patent it. You can patent the way it's delivered, but you can't patent it. What does that mean? That means it's going to require about a billion dollars for a pharmaceutical industry to go through the necessary safety studies that the FDA is requiring, again, above and beyond what they've required for a male product. Who's going to pay a billion dollars for more years of safety study for basically something that's already generic just to get it dosed appropriately? So, I mean, I'm stuck in a bind, right? Because I'm like, I want more women to have access. I want doctors to feel comfortable that they don't have to be like, take this gel and dose it at one tenth the dose, which is like super teeny, right? But if you're just going to put it in a pink box and jack up the price to $400 to pay for your $1 billion study, have we actually helped anybody? And what are we going to need to do to get insurance companies to approve that product? Now, one country in the world has a dosed appropriately testosterone product. That's Australia. That company is coming to do, they're currently doing studies in the UK. And I have heard they're coming to, I got to get them on my podcast, but I have heard they're coming to do studies in America next. So it's coming. But again, for the reasons I said, I'm not sure it's going to be available to everybody. I, pink boxes are expensive. Yeah, I know. But it is really, to your point, it's gender inequity, right? I mean, I just said it was at the early 2000s, late 1990s. And here we are 20 some years later, we're having the same discussions that we did then, mostly because we don't have the resources or the pharmaceutical companies aren't developing or uh, are putting in the resources in order to develop the proper product. So, yeah, I mean, the people, the people to give testosterone to women are the urologists. Why? Because we see the inequality. We also dose 10 times the dose to the men and we're not afraid of it. Yeah. So gynecologists right. are afraid of it because they got taught that testosterone was the male hormone. So they're afraid of it. Again, I, I have a platform now that lets me see the pain that's out there and like what women get told. But it's like, I, I'm not afraid of testosterone. I give 10 times the dose to, you know, Steve every Tuesday. So to me, I'm like, this is a teeny dose. I'm going to check your labs. I'm going to check them two months after you start. I'm going to make sure that you find it beneficial. I'm going to make sure you don't have side effects. Think of the medications we give people from anti-anxiety to blood thinners to crazy heart meds, you know, Ticacin, things that you have to like modulate all the time, cancer drugs. We give people risky medications all day, every day. Hormones are some of the safest medications that you can give people. Yeah. So let's move into the non-hormonal things that are available for what we call hypoactive sexual desire disorder. I think they gave it a new name at this point. It's like low interest or something, but we're talking about that low libido. There are two products that are FDA approved and they've been around for quite some time already. One was FDA approved in 2015, so almost 10 years ago, the other 2019. But I don't personally have any experience with them. I don't know if you do. One is called Addy and the other is Vilesi. And they both work on the neurotransmitters, trying to stimulate the appropriate balance of the neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine in the brain, reducing serotonin, so on and so forth. What's your experience with these drugs and how are they used? Yeah, they're super. I mean, they're novel, right? Because they're not hormonal. And again, we got to step back so we understand how dopamine and serotonin work as far as sex drive goes, because these are really kind of sex drive or interest drugs, which are very interesting. Yeah, I should really quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just to make sure I make the point, they're FDA approved for premenopausal women. So that's another big, huge category that, you know, that this got approved for premenopausal women. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Just on a side note on that, they work in postmenopausal women. The FDA made them split those women into two groups. Yes, for, for no good crazy. for no good but, reason, for hormonal reasons. But yet, that they won't approve hormones, <laughs> yeah, testosterone. Exactly. Yeah, so it's it, there. So yeah. you don't turn into a pumpkin if you take these medications postmenopausal. You're just going to have trouble getting insurance to cover it. Insurance doesn't come knocking on your door and ask you when your last period is. So I can easily get this covered in a, somebody in their fifties, and it's fine. Like, but I'm like, insurance isn't going to come and ask you if you're menopausal or not. So. 
Anyways, because I we have data, it, it works in them. There isn't I, there isn't a medicine contraindication to the postmenopausal female in these medications, just to help people with that. So these are non hormonal. They work in in the brain, centrally acting to the theory is increase the dopamine. Dopamine is our neurotransmitter of seeking. Right? We think we get the dopamine hit when we get the thing, which we do. We get some dopamine with that. But we actually get dopamine released in pursuing the rewarding thing. Our brain needed something to get us to get out of the cave. So it's like, ah, oh, that food was tasty. I'm going to get some dopamine. So I go seek the food. And again, that's where the sex worth desiring comes in. If you do not have sex worth desiring, you do not have a low desire problem. But so that you increase the dopamine and then you say, I'm a little more interested in sex. I'm having some sex dreams, blah, blah, blah. That's how it works. So there's flubanserin brand name Addy that's being marketed as the little pink pill. It is not a blood flow medication like Viagra, so it is not exactly like Viagra, but it was being trialed as an antidepressant and it wasn't a great antidepressant. And so they kind of ended the trial. But the women who are not on the placebo were said, hey, I kind of like this. I kind of am interested in sex more. It's FDA approved for the desire component of sex, but a lot of women will say orgasms are better interest is there's a lot of different components of the sex that is better and to your point earlier you know we had talked about the data doesn't say it improves the number of sexual events by much and that's interesting because how do you measure desire how they had to do it was they measured the amount of times you had sex that's different than your desire for sex but if you take a woman who's having pity sex because she doesn't really desire it and sex isn't that great and you start her on a med that she says, when I have sex now, I like it. I want to have it. You've changed her life. Even if she is only having sex one more time a month, you've changed her life and the life of her relationship. So it doesn't work for everybody. I'm ballparking this. It's about 60% of people it'll work in. So you got to try it before you know. So for me, it's like my women, they've got to get the education first. They've got to know what this med is for. It won't make you less stressed. It won't make you have less things on your plate. It won't fix your relationship, all these things. And then we say, try it for three months. See how you do. It's incredibly safe. Side effect is sleepiness and not sleepiness like I don't feel safe to drive. Sleepiness like I'm well rested at night. Like women were happy about the quality of sleep they were getting on this med. So it's a lovely side effect for people who have you know sleep concerns. It's an incredibly safe med. Again, we give antidepressants to 25% of women in this country in midlife. We give meds with side effects all the time. So it drives me nuts when people are like, ah, is it safe? I'm like, look what we give out all the time and think nothing of it. These are much safer meds. But again, I never prescribe on the first date. To follow that, we give antidepressants to women who are complaining of sexual complaints right? And then sometimes those antidepressants, depending on which one you choose, makes things worse and you're trying to make things better. So we as we're not internists, but still that we see that out there all the time. So you made a really good point. I mean, I, and I want to just say there are naysayers, you know, for this drug, mostly because when they look at the data, they say, well, they say it's a 10% improvement. But when you look at what does that 10% improvement mean, you alluded to that is one satisfying sexual encounter a month. And so some people say, well, does that really mean a success? But I think you also made the point that we don't know what that one event does to the relationship, right? And if it makes it so that the woman is actually enjoying that one episode and can be more intimate with her partner and improve the relationship in that sense. So who is it? It's not for us to judge, right? So even though if you look at 10% doesn't look like a lot. Right. What do people want? Do they want us to have sex every day? Like, what is their endpoint? And again, you, it's very hard to measure desire. So they had to measure something very objective, which is sexual events, but the quality of those sexual events. And I will have you know, you know, the percentage of males who are on this drug of, of all the prescriptions for this pink pill in a pink box, only FDA approved for women's sexual dysfunction. What percentage of sales go to men? Do you know the answer? Yeah, I know the answer. You would think zero, right? Yes. It's not even FDA approved for men. Yeah, and it's pink, for God's sake. <laughs> it is pink. 10%. Wow. 10% yeah. of these prescriptions are going to men because our bodies are all the same, my friends. Yeah. We're not unique. Men have, I'm more interested in sex. Men have low desire too. I'm more interested in sex. My sex quality is better. My orgasms can be better. It is off label, but we give off label stuff to men. Yeah. In a relatively new drug that is nowhere near marketed to them. 
So when we look at the practicality of the phlebacerine, the Addy, you take it every day, right? It's not an episodic drug. You take it every day. But the other one, I don't always say that correctly, a Vilesi, I think is how you pronounce that. Bremelanotide is the generic. Bremelanotide, yeah. And it's an injection that you would inject in your thigh or stomach 45 minutes before anticipated activity which is an, meant to have the same kind of neurotransmitter effects, but increase the dopamine and increase your desire for that sexual counter, but obviously take some planning then, right? So I don't know what kind of experience you've had with that one. I don't use that one, one as much. Number one, you've got needles. Number two, you have to inject yourself with a needle. And I haven't seen as great of insurance coverage for it. I just, I don't think it's out there as much. So I, I don't tend to use it as much. I would use, personally, I use testosterone way more than I use the injectable because I, t- I think testosterone helps with a lot of wellness domains. And if you're, if I, you can just get a woman feeling better in general, you're going to help her sex life. So again, I don't use, I, I don't tend to use the injectable as much. It's an interesting story though, just for fun and giggles on a podcast. It works on the melanocortin receptors. Melanocortin also responsible for darkening of skin and skin pigmentation. So a side effect can be skin pigmentation. They were studying this drug as a sunless tanning product. Somebody involved in the company gave themselves a double dose and they had an erection for a day. (laughs) And they said, maybe there's something here in the role of sexual function. I just love drug discovery stories. They're the best. That's amazing. I didn't know that story. Yeah. So the data would show that it's similar to the filibanserine and that it's pretty, you know, when you look at the satisfying sexual encounters is, I think, 0.5 instead of one in a month. So it's a little less. But yet again, to our point before, if that's something that's important to you and it works for you, then that amount is, it's not for us to judge. But I do see the difficulty with this when you're having to take it 45 minutes before you're being planful, you're having to make that decision. And oftentimes for women, it's difficult to make that decision and push yourself into that Point, if you really have no desire, how am I pushing myself forward? Once the engine starts warming up, sometimes it's a lot easier, right, to keep going. But it's getting that initial push over and having to give yourself an injection and I think would be a little bit more of a difficult situation. The other tricky thing with that med is the rate of nausea, at least in the beginning. They say it does wear off with repeated use. but the rate. So some people will prescribe on Dancitron with it because being nauseous is definitely not sexy. <laughs> so it's a significant risk of, of nausea. So again, I don't use it much, so I, I haven't really done that. But just for people to know, you're going to get that side effect with that drug, but not with the flibanserin. Well, thanks. Let's look, you know, one last little area that I want to talk about is as urologists, you know, what it is that we're able to do and then what is it that we're not able to do, but we might have resources at our fingertips. What do we refer out to? So we know People who do work in sexual health, where it's men or women, we know that it's multifactorial and have like pelvic floor physical therapists at our fingertips or sex therapists, sex therapists for the individual, sex therapists for the couple, so on and so forth. When is it appropriate then? Like what situations do we need to be thinking about these other types of resources for our patients? Certainly, we've talked about the testosterone. That's something that we can do. Some of the other medications, those are things that we can do. But we can't really help with the more supratentorial components, right? I think we can talk to them a little bit about it, but if they need some counseling or therapy, you must have good sex therapists in your area. And do you have difficulty referring people to sex therapists because Maybe the couple doesn't want to do it together. Maybe, I don't know, lots of things going on there. A super good question. I always laugh because apparently the the sex therapists tell me like people don't want to come and see them because the stereotype is that sex therapists watch you have sex and judge you. Oh my, (laughs) that's not what sex therapists do at all. It's a a lack of understanding of what the role of a sex therapist is. They did that in the 70s with the Kinsey Report, but we don't do that anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) totally. So pelvic floor physical therapy, any pain with sex any pain causes muscle tightness. Muscles get tight to try to protect you. That's not always in our conscious understanding. So really seeing people to be like getting comfortable with touch, getting comfortable with touch that doesn't cause pain, learning how to relax, the role of the breath, all of those important things. I am not a physical therapist. I am not a sex therapist, and I don't want to be either one of those. So it's part of a team. And I I tell patients that I'm like, I'm a three-legged stool, right? I can do the medications 
And I really, I mean, I got into this. I wrote the book and started the podcast because I'm like, I can make your pelvis great. I can give you Viagra. I can give you vaginal estrogen. I can tell you to use lube. But if you have prejudices against sex, sex is dirty, so pleasure isn't for me, I don't want to touch myself, all those things, I can't, that's not my job. So it was kind of the learning more about sex to be like, this is not just hormones and a hole and a hard penis. This is complicated social cultural construct that we really can uncover and learn a lot. I mean, I recently saw a couple, she was coming in pain with sex. They weren't communicating about it. I'm like, go read my book. Go see the physical therapist. Here's the vaginal. She comes back and she's like, we've been married for 45 years. We're having the best sex of our lives now. Thank you so much. She's like, we started talking about it. We communicate. We try new things. Like, it's okay to try things and fail, right? But like, I get the wins coming back. Like, I've saved marriages repeatedly, right? And I'd say to me, that is more satisfying than seeing if I can get a semi erect penis 20% better. Oh, by the way, you can have sex without a erect penis because we can't fix all erectile right. dysfunction. So, Sex therapists are amazing. Uh, resources for that, hermanandwallace.com for, to find a, a well-trained pelvic floor physical therapist. ASECT, American Association for Clinical Sex Therapists, something like that, asect.org for license. It's rigorous to become a sex therapist. They don't just let anybody hang a shingle. Great resource for finding. And not all marriage and couple therapists are comfortable talking about sex, just like not all doctors are comfortable talking about sex. So really finding somebody who can help that conversation. Communication's yeah. huge. So I think the biggest thing is knowing what the resources are, doing a little bit of groundwork to find out who's in your neighborhood, right, who can help you out so that you have an answer for the patient who is sitting in front of you to say, I'm not the one to really sit with you and help you with these things, but here is someone who can, right? Because I think there's so much shame associated when it gets to that point. And that's what I see. And I think just helping the woman get through that shame, that saying, hey, there's no reason to be shameful about this and it's a common problem. We just need to get you to the right person. And being that source of support for the woman in that sense, I think is really important. So knowing who your resources are in your neighborhood is super important. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And if you don't have resources, I created my podcast for this reason. I wrote my book for this reason because people learn best when they're feeling safe and at home, you know, they can consume it on their time. It's very lovely. And then when they consume those resources and come back, the level of conversation you can have with these people is so much more elevated than if they didn't get that education first. Yeah. So that's great. I created what I what I thought needed to exist. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly Casperson. It's just been really a joy. It's been super fun. And for all those people out there, please check out her podcast and her book. It's on Amazon. You are not broken. It's not only a good resource for physicians to learn more themselves, but for patients, as she said. I've used it many times for my patients. So it's really a great resource. Check it out. Thanks for having me. Until next time. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman, and Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ovijinski. Show notes and social media by Emma Landenwich and Lindsay Beecham. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.